1 John chapter 2, as we finish up uh, this particular passage, uh, verses uh, 18 through 26, we'll look at. And we've entitled this kind of this section of 1 John as Caution, Danger Ahead. I will not tell you all the caution labels and signs again. Hopefully you remember that from other weeks. But basically the point is this. In the Bible, there are times of caution and, and concern. We ought to take note of those things. The Bible does not speak, speak frivolously. It does not speak in hand. It wants us to know something. And John here gives us a warning. You know, as parents, we give our kids warnings. And uh, sometimes, maybe parents, you do like we see in the Bible sometimes where people go to the extreme. All right, I think that happens in the Garden of Eden when Eve answers the serpent. The serpent says, well, you can't have this fruit. She goes, no, we can't eat it. We can't even touch it lest we die. Well, you know that God never said they couldn't touch it, but most likely Adam said, listen, honey, all right, don't eat this thing. In fact, don't even touch it. You know, as parents, you know, we sometimes go to the extreme on the warnings. Hey, be careful about this and watch about this. And here John is not going to the extreme, but he's given us a warning to watch out. And that warning is that there will be people among us that are going to stray from the truth. They're going to stray from the truth. About a year and a half ago, I mentioned this in church, but there was a popular basketball star who mentioned that he believed the earth was flat. Get on an airplane, buddy. It ain't flat. Since then, I've looked up some conspiracy theories just to see what people actually believe in. And they believe things, the earth is flat, that the landing on the moon, that was all made up by Hollywood. We never landed on the moon. And, and those crazy things like that. And when we see some of those things, it is easy to look at that and say, wow, you are a nut job. You are crazy. I remember I read one here uh, a few weeks back that, that Finland did not exist. Finland was all, was all made up. I can't wait to read that the United States doesn't exist. Probably someone believes that. But it's, it's crazy out there. And when we see some of those things, we're quick to say, wow, those people, they've got a screw loose. They're one, short fry, uh, they're one fry short of a happy meal. And uh, yet John says there's something to be warned about inside of a church setting. In 1 John chapter number 2, beginning verse 18, John says this, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that, this, that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. We looked at that two weeks ago and how the Antichrist, anything, any, anyone that is against the Messiah, that is against the Anointed One, that is anti-God. It is not just the Antichrist referred to in the first and verse 18 during the tribulation time, but also they can have many Antichrists. The fact is you can know people who are going to be Antichrist, all right, a very, a very stout connotation, a very stout, um, a very stout label on these people. They're against the anointed one. They're, they're not for the truth. But verse 20, we looked at this last night, and I love this verse, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. No excuse in the Christian life if you have the Holy Spirit. He'll never fail us. He has enough power for us. And we look at our text for tonight, verse 21, but I have, I have written unto you because ye know not the truth, or I have not written to you because ye know the, not the truth, but because ye know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is a Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised to us even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. You see that John says, listen, I've written you these things because there's going to be some people that want to seduce you. Not talking about a moral seduction here, but a, a seduction of the mind, a seduction of belief, a seduction of practice in a religious type connotation, a Christian setting. He says, I'm writing you, I'm warning you, because, because there are going to be some people out there, some men and some women who are going to bring some concepts that are going to be seductive to you. They're going to try to lure you away. I love to fish, and the Lord blessed us, many of you know, when you came to our house with a pond. And we must have the stupidest fish in all of the world. Have you ever fished a spot that they say has been overfished? 
Not because there's not fish in there, but because everything you throw at it, they just, they just don't, they look at it and, and spit out. Our fish are not that way in my pond. We've got some catfish and some bluegill. And uh, when we moved in, the neighbors said, boy, there's no fish. They, they, uh, they fished it all out, and there's nothing left in there. And they were wrong, thankfully. And we've caught some bluegills and caught some catfish, but, but this, our fish will bite at anything. You say, anything, Pastor Howell? Well, yes, let me tell you. We can throw a line. I've thrown a line in there with a worm on the hook. I expect them to bite the worm and the hook. That's natural. But they're gnawing on my fishing line that lands in the water. And so they bite the hook, and then like five or six fish will, will bite the line. They are the stupidest fish ever. I remember when I was growing up, we went to a trout farm. At this particular trout farm, I ever been to one of those fish farms to fish? The trout farm, you paid by the inch. And those fish, would, you'd catch them with corn on the hook in the trout farm. We were there fishing. I remember my brother Aaron, my younger brother Aaron. We turned over, and apparently he said, this is stupid. And he had grabbed a net. And this big old net had dipped it full of trout, probably $200 worth of trout. My dad turns around and begins to stress out, and, and uh, then the owner says, you know, if you catch the fish, they die, so you don't have to pay for them, but it's a big mess. But I wonder if sometimes we're like those fish concerning the truth. We bite at anything. And here John is giving us a warning. Let's pray and ask for his blessing. Help. Lord, help us tonight as we look at this passage. Lord, give us your wisdom, your truth, your knowledge. Lord, may we see from Scripture what you have us to learn and to obtain. Lord, help me to say those things that would be helpful and would further your cause and kingdom. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I see uh, in this passage, in verse 21, an exhortation. If you look at verse 21, John says this, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it. And then he makes this phrase, and that no lie is of the truth. Now John, um, throughout the Gospel of John and the book of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, will make these kind of obvious statements. Uh, the big word is tautology, all right, when he repeats the same thing. But this is a different type of statement that he makes right here when he says, and that no lie is of the truth. At first glance, we would appear to almost call it a truism. Now, a truism uh, is a statement that really uh, is obviously true and says nothing new or interesting. All right, some examples of truisms are like this. Uh, the apple never far, falls far from the tree. That would be a truism. Like a son is like the father, daughter is like the parents. All right, it's not new or interesting, and maybe just packaged it a little bit differently. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Right? Boy, that's a comforting statement. I think I'll get a tattoo with it. Did you just say tattoo in church? Absolutely, why not? Here's one always get a second opinion. Now, is that true or not? Well, sometimes. You know, should I marry Doreen? Don't get a second opinion, just say yes. An apple a day keeps a doctor away. Yeah, that's not true at all. Not true. Uh, onion a day keeps a doctor away, actually. It won't show up. April showers bring May flowers. And if we're not careful, some of those truisms, we, we take this phrase and, and put it into that category. No lie is of the truth. And, and if we're not careful, we take that phrase and we say, oh, well, John, obviously... Uh, truth uh, is not lie, and lie is not truth. So, John, why are you saying that no lie is of the truth? And I think John is not just saying a truism, though there's an aspect of that truth, but he's giving us a truth of vital importance. He was uh, acknowledging some errors in this, uh, the time period that he was writing, but also he was giving us a thought, giving us a truth that there's a great influencing in our minds, and that error often appears to be plausible. That error often appears to be plausible. Remember that he packages this section by saying this, I'm warning you about the, the ones that are going to try to seduce you. That he's saying, listen, there's going to be some people that are going to try to trick you, but, but that error at times appears to be plausible. When Eve was in the garden of the serpent, it appeared to her to be plausible. But no lie is of the truth. And he's saying, you know, there's an exhortation here. We have, to, we have to be careful that when we walk through this life, that there's going to be truth and there's going to be error, and we have to have the discernment to know the error from the truth. And it comes in like this. Really? Do you go to church three times a week? 
Don't you, don't you think that it'd be better if you had some family time? Now, how many think that you ought to have family time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how many think for a strong family you ought to have family time? I agree with that 100%. But how many think that family time is better spent at church all right, than watching TV? Amen. But it appears to be plausible. Come on, that's all right. It'll be great. And you guys can eat out. I mean, you just bond as a family. Be careful. No lie. No lie is of the truth. I was reading a, a book this past week. I tried to read and, and keep my knowledge expanding and growing. And they talked about the particular movement of the, what they call the seeker-sensitive church or the progressive church. And it's an entire movement. And how they began this movement, uh, a particular pastor out on the, on the west, west side of the United States, he went to this place and then he had some studies done and they determined that in order to get people to church, you had to make them feel comfortable. Now, should people feel comfortable at church? Yes, absolutely. When they walk in the door, like for friend day, I see that we're greeting people. I've had many people who visit here tell us, boy, you have such a friendly church and that is a testimony to you folks. Amen. Amen. You expect me to greet them, and I expect myself to greet them, and, and they expect me to greet them. But when the church family greets people and says, we're glad you're here, thanks for coming, boy, that speaks volumes. Teenagers, you listen to me, teenagers? When you go talk to visitors, all right, teenagers, you go talk to visitors, that can be life-changing. They don't expect teenagers to talk to them, a visitor. And that's way outside your comfort zone, way outside. But when you go shake hands, young people, little, little kids, Go shake visitors' hands, all right? They ought to feel comfortable, all right? Older folks, senior saints, well, shake people's hands if you can move that far. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Oh, I'm going to be in trouble for that one. I know, I know. But they ought to feel comfortable, right? People come to church, should they not? Absolutely. But they went to that, that sounds plausible and said, well, in order to make them feel comfortable, we want them to hear, and this was a quote the same music they'd hear when they're riding in their car. You see, the music they chose was on purpose to make them feel comfortable when they come into, come into the church building. Now, I hope people feel comfortable, but I don't want them to hear the same music that they hear in their car that would be on a radio station or on their, on their phone or some streaming service. It ought to be different music. It's got to be Christian music. They said, make them feel comfortable. Then they said, listen, when you speak, when you preach... Don't preach on sin. So what he said. So the study said, don't preach on sin. Preach on just some life topics that will encourage them. He wanted to say because of this, he, they built a very, very large ministry. It, it is still to this day very, very massive. The problem is that truth, that error, I'm sorry, the error sounds plausible. You say, oh, yeah. People ought to feel comfortable when they come to church, so I better change my music. People ought to feel comfortable, so I better change my message. But no, no, no. John says, listen, there's an exhort exhortation. Understand that no lie is of the truth. So you have to make sure that you know what you know. You have to make sure that you know the truth. He's saying here, you've heard the truth. You've been taught the truth. You know, sometimes people will, re will reject what they've been taught. I'm fine with people changing certain things. Uh, I like omelets, and if my kids decide to like scrambled eggs, I'm okay with that. Who cares? I'm okay that, that maybe I like the color blue and they're the color green. That's okay. But when we start giving away the truth that we've been raised with, see, I was taught a few other things. I was taught that church was a big deal. That's truth. That's true that when people begin to diminish truth and they say, listen, I can worship at home just as easily as at church, they've missed the mark. No lie is of the truth. I was taught that Jesus cares. All right, that's the truth. The Bible teaches me that. All right, and, and, yet, and yet you will meet people. They'll say, you know what, well, he doesn't really, he doesn't really care about all your needs. I was talking to someone very recently. And like, I don't, I don't think... Jesus really cares that they're just coincidences that happen. You know what? I have a whole lot of coincidences in my life then. I got a whole lot of prayers that just happened to, just happened to work out. Even this past week, going, going, to, uh, going to Puerto Rico, the Lord did some very specific things. Uh, that clearly was the hand of God. And I love seeing the hand of God work in my life. 
I love it when he answers prayers. That's the truth. And yet, the, the seduction comes, the lie comes. You know what? Prayer's not that big a deal. No, prayer's a big deal. It's a big deal to God. It'll be a big deal to me. I was taught to be careful. Little eyes, little ears, little hands. What you do, see, and, and listen to, right? And hear. That's the truth. Now, there's, now the thought's out there. Well, it doesn't really matter what you do because, boy, there's a lot of grace out there and God will forgive all those things. And he will, but that's not the truth. You see, you have to, you've heard the truth, but you have to practice the truth. You have to be able to see what the right path is. And, and John says here in verse 21, he goes, I've not written to you because you don't know what to do. He said, I've written to you because you know the truth. And remember this, no lie is of the truth. There's an exhortation. Though I also see next, or next I see an explanation. Verses 22 and 23. He begins to describe some of the errors that were, were being given there. He says, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. The explanation is this. He said they begin to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Listen, be careful if anyone denies the deity of Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right? That means he was God before he was God when he came and what God afterward. He was God all the time. The deity of Jesus Christ. You can't deny Christ's background. He was born of a virgin woman. All right? That is, that is intrinsic to the gospel story that he was born of Mary. See, the reason he could not be born of, of, of a man is because that sin came through, through Adam. And through men and death passed upon all men. Except that Jesus wasn't born of a man, he was born of a woman and the Holy Ghost. The deity of Jesus Christ preserves our salvation. Denying Christ's birth, denying Christ's business. He says this in the passage, Who is the liar that, that, that he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? You see, they weren't denying that he lived. They weren't denying that he did some good things. They were just denying that he was who he claimed to be, that he was the anointed one, the one foretold in the Old Testament, the one that is promised to bring us salvation. There is only one way to heaven. And listen, friend, we have to remember that Jesus is the only way. And you say, well, Pastor How, of course, we're a Baptist church. Of course we know that. Of course we're not going to let anyone deny that. But are we? We live in a world of tolerance. And the tolerance says this, you can believe what you want to believe, just don't be mad at me for my belief. I am trying to take people from other churches. A lot of Catholic churches out there that I'm trying to give people the gospel to. I am. Sorry. It's the truth. I don't believe that's the way to heaven. I believe the way to heaven is clearly shown in the Bible through Jesus Christ, not through anyone else, not through Mary. I believe that the Bible was the inspired word of God. It is one reason, it is one reason, uh, just one of them, why I use the King James Version. All right, one of the, one of the revisers of the other Greek texts, the other versions, said this, and he said this in, in one of his letters, he said this, that praying to Mary has the same effect as praying to Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, that's not the truth. It's not. Because they say, well, you know, praying to the mother, she can influence the son. Listen, moms can't. I have a mom. I love to listen to my mom. And unwritten rule, you mess with my mom, you mess with me. But praying to Mary is not the same effect as praying to Jesus Christ. And it, we're, if we're not careful, because we live in a day of tolerance, we say, okay, well, I don't really want to offend you. No, no, no. Jesus is naturally offensive when you give the truth. It's naturally offensive. I don't want to give it in an offensive manner. Okay, but the truth is offensive. You're telling someone else, you're wrong. He, they were denying the deity of Jesus Christ, but they also were denying the doctrine of God. They deny in this passage, they denied the Father and the Son and, and denied His teaching. You know, even, even uh, 50, 60 years ago, there was a Christian writer, not a Baptist, put out a version of the Bible, not a version, but, a, but a, uh, um, a reference Bible for us. In the reference Bible, he talked about what's called the gap theory in creation. 
The gap theory says this, that Jesus, or God, I'm sorry, made, uh, made the first day, created the first day, and then there was a gap of time for evolution to take place. All right, and the second day, then a gap, it's called the gap theory. And so they kind of merge evolution and creation. Well, I'm sorry, but my Bible teaches that God created the heavens and the earth in seven literal, or six literal days and rested on the seventh day. There's no room for, for discussion there. And there's, you're going to find that there are going to be other believers, all right, who will deny the doctrines of God. I'm not talking about some standards or perhaps that, that they'll do a, have a different type of worship style and, and though I disagree with them, I'm talking about some actual doctrines where we say, no, listen, that's not right. That's not proper. You know, it, it, is, it is not proper for a lady to preach in church. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not against women. I'm married to one. She's beautiful, all right? And, and actually, Christianity exalts women in that culture. Women were given a place in Christianity they didn't have anywhere else. But as I look at the Bible and I study the Bible, the Bible has some doctrine, teaches about that. All right? And they deny that, say, wait a second. In fact, there are some, some guys who are, who are Baptists who went to good Bible colleges. Say, my wife is pastor so-and-so. My wife's not a pastor here at First Baptist Church. It's not up for vote. You may want her to be pastor because she's so friendly, but after she preached once, she wouldn't want her any longer. So I often tease, I was talking to Miss Chrissy today, she's, uh, uh, they're down, pastor is pre preaching in Jackson, Michigan tonight, and I called Chrissy, it's her birthday today, and I called her, and, and I often tease her and ask her if she was preaching, and she goes, I have a few things I have to say to you, and, uh, <clears throat> but, but the Bible says, the Bible says something else, I didn't make it up, I didn't write it, so don't get mad at the messenger, they deny the doctrine, I wonder, do you know, do you know? what the Bible says. Why do you do what you do? Why are you here on a Sunday night? Hopefully it's not just because you have nowhere better to be. That's the only reason Then please, you don't have to come back. Though I don't think there's anywhere better you could be. But that shouldn't be the only reason you're here, First Baptist Church, on a Sunday night. Yeah, hopefully you're not here because, oh, if I'm not there, you know, Pastor Howell will be like, where are you? Don't come because I'm looking for you, though I'd love to see you in your place. It has your name engraved on it. You aren't allowed to move in this auditorium. Hopefully you know from the Bible why you come to church. All right, well, well, Pastor, one time you said this. I'm glad I said it, and I'll say it again what the Bible teaches about it, but you ought to know from the Bible. You need to know why you believe what you believe, why you come to church, why you have a testimony in the workplace, how you'll witness to people. Why you, why you do, why you have the standards and principles that you have in your life. Why you deny certain things. Why you say, no, that's an error. You got to know from the Bible. We got to know from the Bible. And the Bible challenges us to, to have the truth and to know the truth. So I'd say this, a simple phrase, know the Bible. Know the Bible. Study the Bible. Read the Bible. Love the Bible. But know the Bible. Be ready to give an answer to every man. This is why I do what I do. This is why we talk this way in my house. Because the Bible teaches this. This is the way, this is the way we're going to handle ourselves when there's an argument. Because the Bible says this. This is why we're going to listen to this music because the Bible says this. This is why we're going to attend a particular church because the Bible teaches this. This is why we're going to maybe dress this way or, or do this or do that. But know the Bible Know what the Bible says about hope. Does the Bible talk about hope? Absolutely. But sometimes when we have a hopeless coworker, we begin to string verses together. Make up our own verse. Because we know about the Bible, but too often we don't know the Bible. Explanation. Know the Bible. And lastly, I see in this passage an encouragement. Verses 24 through 26. He begins that, that phrase, that passage with this, let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. John says, let me encourage you. You know that truth that you've heard from the beginning when you first knew Jesus? We're referencing back to that time frame. Let that abide in you or let that remain in you or one other word that you could substitute there is let that continue in you. Look at that. We stuck that up everywhere in here. Let that continue you know what John is saying here? He says, I want to encourage you to continue. 
Encourage to continue in the truth that you know and encourage to continue in what and where you ought to be, what you heard from the beginning. No one has ended up in the wrong place when they continue to follow Jesus Christ. He won't lead you astray. He won't lead you down the wrong path. I know many people have ended up in the wrong place, but not because of Jesus Christ, not because of his word. Continue. His encouragement to continue. An encouragement to, to rejoice. He says in verse 25, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Now this struck me as interesting in the study because John has just now talked for about seven verses about being careful in the church, being careful of truth. And he could have gone a lot of places about reminding us what will give us hope and joy in this life. But he used the very best one. He said, just remember this as you continue. There's encouragement to rejoice. You have eternal life. Because wrapped up inside of that phrase, is, wrapped up inside of those words, is this concept, number one, you will see Jesus again. Continue, because you're going to see Jesus again, and that eternal life is unending. It'll never stop. So he says, here's a perspective. You're going to see Jesus, and it's going to go on and on and on and on. So if you're discouraged by those around you, if you look around and see some that have fallen off the path, off the way, it's okay. It's okay, because you're going to see Jesus. You can make it. See, do we live in the light of eternal life? Oh, we know Jesus can come back. And we may even pray, Lord, come back quickly. But he's coming back. And we get to live with him forever and ever. So my grandpa's with him right now. He's with him right now. And his life of 90 or 91 years, I can't remember exactly, he just had a birthday. I think it was the 20th. 90 plus years on this earth. And now he's with Jesus. You know what? As John said, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. He said, here's your encouragement to rejoice. You have eternal life. You've got something better. So when the bills are big, you have eternal life. When it seems hopeless, you have eternal life. Nothing competes with eternal life. Nothing. Encouragement to rejoice. And then the last one is the encouragement to resist. The encouragement to resist. Continue to resist. He says, these things have I written unto you that concerning them that seduce you. This whole passage was a big warning. It used to be they travel in multitudes, setting up camp in every village and clearing, peddling their wares. They were called now snake oil peddlers. Their product was often a concoction of anything from alcohol to spring water and claimed to solve every illness known to man, no matter what the condition. They have carved for themselves, these snake oil peddlers, a permanent place in American history. America, the opportunity place. They travel from town to town and, and begin to, uh, to hawk their, their different concoctions. We see them today under the banners of paid programming. Do we not? Buy this product. It will solve all of life's problems. How could you live without this knife or without this particular thing on, uh, on TV? From wonder car polishes to quick fix to tape that you can build a boat out of. They make the buyer, whoever misses their opportunity, never, or they make the buyer who misses their opportunity appear foolish for passing up such a tremendous offer. The sad fact is that these same tactics travel under the banner of Christianity today. This is the quick fix for your church. This is the quick fix for your family, for your relationship. If you don't do this, then you aren't really a Christian. Sometimes they bind spirits of poverty and release the power of wealth, work a crowd into a frenzy, all the while saying that this frenzy is true worship of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't even resemble the God who is described in Scripture. Multiplied by thousands of people who daily and weekly send in donations. But our commitment, 
is to the Scripture, to God's Word. So that when we may see these ones that John calls Antichrist, we say no lie is of the truth. I'm challenging us to be committed to the truth, to follow the truth, but in order to follow it, you have to know the truth. Lord, I thank you for your word, for the truth that you bring to us. Lord, you're a good God, gracious God. Lord, you've given us a word, your word, that we can understand, and yet, or too often, we relegated to a small time of our day. I wonder who would say, Pastor Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me. I want to be committed to the truth. I haven't been committed like I ought to be. Would you pray for me that I'll be committed to the truth like John challenges us to be? Would you pray for me tonight? Stand up, slip it down. Amen. Amen. I need to be committed to the truth. Amen. 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 Maybe some families need to commit to the truth, to know why they do what they do. Some dads have a stand of the truth. Lord, help us. We've seen these hands. Lord, help our hearts to be turned towards you and our minds to be directed by your truth and your word. Lord, guide this invitation in Jesus' name.